NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. Thank you so much for everyone who is joining us for the second panel on day one of our 19th annual State Criminal Justice Network Conference. Uh, my colleague, Jamana Musa, is going to be our, our moderator and looking forward to the discussion. Um, my name is Monica Reed. I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of Advocacy here at the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. So I'm going to introduce again my colleague, Jamana. She is a human rights attorney and racial justice advocate. Um, she is currently serving as our director of the Fourth Amendment Center here at NACDL, and she will be moderating the second panel of the conference, When Robocop Becomes Reality, Confronting Technology in the Criminal Justice System. Thank you so much, Damana. Thank you, Monica. Um, so I'm glad to have everybody here. I'll say good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I, you know, at this point, we understand that technology is really infiltrating every part of the criminal justice system you know, from policing to charging to prosecution to what happens to people uh, who are getting considered for release. And one of the things that I know is that as right now, people are really working very hard to try and unwind this era of mass incarceration that we've been through. Uh, this is really winding up an era of mass criminalization where people are being put in databases, they're being surveilled in, in sort of new and more aggressive ways than they ever have been before. And I also know that it can be difficult to confront this type of technology uh, for people who are accustomed to doing criminal justice reform, but then get the sense that like, but this is technology, I'm not a scientist, I don't know tech. Uh, I can tell you, I don't know tech. Uh, I was an international relations major in college that has nothing to do with tech. But at the same time, once you sort of dig in and understand what you'll see and what you'll hear from our panelists is that it's really no different than anything else you're confronting when it comes to criminal justice reform, right? It's really trying to intervene between uh, the, the intention of uh, investigating and infiltrating communities in ways that bring negative consequences to moving to a place where communities are sort of uplifted and upheld and getting what they need versus uh, having what they don't want imposed on them. And so uh, we have three fantastic guests who are going to help us demystify some of the um, work around how do you do criminal justice reform in the age of technology. The first, and I'm going to give them brief introductions because I know you have their bios, is, and I'm going to introduce them in the order that they'll be speaking. They are each going to speak for a period of time. We'll have time uh, to do a Q&A afterwards. The first is Josma Trujillo, who is a writer and organizer who works on policing and criminalization in New York City. Uh, the second, we'll hear from Tawana Petty, who's the director of the Data Justice Program uh, at, <laughs> I, 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 forgive me, because I have DC. TP, and I do not remember exactly what that stands for. That is my fault for not, really, uh, for not spelling it out. But she's also a convening member of the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. And then we'll be wrapping it up with John Jones III, who is currently on staff for Just Cities as the Director of Community and Political Engagement. He's also a father of three uh, and an East Oakland resident. And I will say, I think what's particularly interesting to me is all of us on this panel are parents. And I think that's critical because what's happening right now is changing the nature of how our children will be considered or surveilled or encounter the criminal justice system, much different than uh, you know, our generation or those that came before us. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Jasmar. Great, thanks for, for having me. Um, yes, I think uh, for us as parents and for tons of people who uh, are parents or wanna be parents or want our, uh, want our kids to have kids and want uh, our futures uh, you know, basically want to fight for our futures. I think um, thinking about policing and thinking about criminalization, uh, prosecutors' offices going forward is just as important as the battles that we take on in the here and now. Uh, oftentimes, a lot of uh, what you traditionally see uh, from the policing movement is usually in response to something that happens. And we're fighting kind of like uh, after the fact, or it seems like we're fighting after the fact to gain some gain something that we should we should we shouldn't even have to fight for. Um, but oftentimes, the police and and prosecutors and and the law enforcement agencies uh, more broadly are forward thinking. Um, I remember when I was in uh, college reading about proactive policing uh, and that idea coming out of New York City with uh, some of the advances that came in the '90s and CompStat and. Uh, the broken windows theory of policing, they were always trying to get out ahead and they were always thinking towards the future. Um, 
And then today, uh, in, the two, in 2020, we have predictive policing and we have drones and we have uh, things that, you know, 25 years ago would have seemed like something you'd probably have to go to the movies uh, to see. So um, that being said, I think a lot of what policing has to, uh, policing activism or activism around criminalization and policing has to be forward thinking, has to, of course, include the fights for justice for people uh, who are hurt by police and by the criminal justice system in the here and now. Um, and also fight to uh, sometimes undo the harms, the continuing harms of policies that are, you know, that were instituted 20 years ago. You know, the last couple of years in New York City, we were fighting the legacy of the broken windows theory of policing and how it affects uh, mostly uh, poor communities of color um, and how it was designed to be that way. And that is a theory that was a theory that was operationalized more than 25 years ago, you know, a quarter century ago when I was in, uh, in uh, high school. So we have to fight those battles and we need to fight for the future and we need to be uh, completely aware of what police are doing and what are planning to doing so that our kids and our grandkids don't have to fight those battles uh, or don't have to fight um, battles that are, uh, you know, almost where the police have all of these things already set up. We have to get out in front of these things. And so uh, we have to be proactive in that sense too. Uh, oftentimes I feel like we're, we're fighting one step behind police, we're reacting to things. Um, so as much as we can, and to, to bring those things just even to the consciousness, right? To the consciousness of the public, things that they're not even aware of. Uh, I'm not a policing scholar, I'm not an attorney, I am not an academic. Uh, I am a person who came into policing through uh, education activism because I was fighting to save my son's school. And what I found there was all of the parents, and this was a pre predominantly black and Latino school, all of the parents, we had all of these issues with criminalization, with police. And so we were talking about education, but we were talking about the system around us and policing was another side of it that infected all of our lives. And so I got into policing uh, activism or activism against policing kind of, uh, kind of just by, by chance. And the more I found out about it, the more I realized how much work needed to be done. Um, and so when we talk about the drones or predictive policing, uh, one thing that's on my plate right now is gang databases and social media surveillance of, uh, of young people. Um, we, when we talk about those things, uh, those, some of those things need to be impacted and are new to people. Uh, those aren't like uh, conversations you have casually about uh, policing nowadays. Uh, a couple of years ago in New York City, we had stop and frisk and that eventually became after 10 plus years of hard organizing, uh, it became something that you could talk at the dinner table about with anybody. And we have to make some of these other issues that police are throwing at us the same way. We have to make them something that the public has to engage with, has to have a discussion about, uh, and has to see them for what they the, for what they are. And that takes a lot of work, but that also I think can be helped by all of the energy that's in the streets uh, and and all the energy that has poured out just in the last couple of months. Um, we have tons of people coming into this space, tons of new minds, tons of new ideas coming in, and so we can branch out and talk about of course, the traditional issues with policing, right? Uh, extrajudicial killings, um, you know, kind of like uh, basic criminalization, basic uh, issues of arrests and, and, and enforcement. But we can also talk about predictive algorithms and we can talk about drones and we can talk about all of these things that the police are trying to lay down for us in the future. So hopefully with this, no, you know, with this uh, wellspring of new energy, uh, the policing, the, the movements around policing and, and law enforcement can kind of hit all of those things at the same time and say, no, you're not going to criminalize us in the here and now, and you're also not going to criminal, criminalize us uh, 10, 20 years from now. All right, thank you. And just more, if we, before we move on, if I could just ask you to talk a little bit more about, you know, I, I, in your report um, that you all put out in December, you talked a lot about the gang databases and how they work. And I think the things that were particularly interesting to me was um, all the ways in which they are, can be inaccurate, right? I mean, they found everything from babies being on the list to people being put on the list because they all like a particular song to you know, any one of a number of ways they scrub social media. Um, and I know you said somewhere in there that New York has a couple of, you know, sort of checkpoints where they, they stop and recheck, are you still on the gang or do you, do you get to get off the list? Um, in other cities, I've not seen really any way of either knowing you're on the list or ways of getting off the list or even knowing they check back in with the list. So. I would love if you could talk a little bit about that and sort of how that functions in the context of people being criminalized and charged and prosecuted. 
Right. Uh, so yeah, let me b- take a step back and also say the the issue with the gang database is something that, um, you know, we were dealing with a lot of the issues of, as I mentioned before, of kind of everyday policing, everyday criminalization and uh, we considered broken windows to be a form of surveillance, a physical form of surveillance where the police had constant contact with people. Uh, and then there was the fight against stop and frisk. And then we kind of became aware of this gang database. Now, the gang database in New York City wasn't as prolific as it was in on the West Coast and or in some other cities, some other urban cities. Um, but we had one for years. Um, but when the this new administration under Bill de Blasio came in, they drastically expanded it and added thousands of new names to it. And they also expanded the ways in which they couldn't validate you or, or tag you as a gang member. And one of those was social media um, uh, surveillance, uh, what you post, right? And some of the other ones were things that police had done, you know, traditionally in terms of tagging people that were kind of vague criteria, where you live, what colors you wear, um, that really left it up for interpretation of police. So the gang database kind of popped up onto our radar. And, and the more we looked at it, of course, it was 99.5% Black and uh, Latino and non-white. Um, but the, the more that we looked at it, it kind of mirrored and in some ways was worse than the traditional issues with criminalization and racially disparate policing we'd seen with Stop and Frisk. Um, and so as we looked at those things, um, we kind of saw some of the worst parts of the criminal justice system or of criminalization we saw. One is that police have complete control over the system, right? Complete control over the process from the beginning to end. The, there is no check over it. And I say that like not thinking that all they need is someone to look over their shoulder and it'll be fine, but they didn't even have that. They didn't even have uh, some sort of a, process, a, a public facing process where you could say, okay, there's some, at least someone kind of checking and making sure there's not rampant abuse. So in places uh, like California, you had wild ab- abusive uh, actions by police who tagged people, tagged babies and toddlers as gang members. Um, in the Chicago uh, uh, gang database report that the inspector general put out, you had police officers putting people's occupations as scumbag and, and bum and stuff like that. I mean, so if, if that gives you a kind of a glimpse into what how, how police look at the process, you can imagine how police look at the people who they are throwing into that process. Um, and so the gang database to me is, became kind of a, a new symbol of what policing is uh, at its core, uh, completely arbitrary, uh, abusive, ripe for abuse, um, and racist. And those three ingredients you, you can find in a lot of policing. But in this one, you saw the, ab- the ability of police to do that and thinking that they could get away with it as long as they call you a gang member. And what they were banking on was the idea that if you're a gang member, no one will advocate for you. And so that was a very political move by the police to say, let's do some of the worst things that we can do and let's just make the public not want to advocate or not want to defend these individuals. And so you had, a, you, and, and this was, you know, this is also, I mean, this is uh, something that they banked on thinking that the, the connotation of gang was something that would serve them. Um, but you know, at, at the same time, all of the same due process issues or issues of, of people's, uh, you know, basic civil liberties still applied, but police were more than willing to, to, to kind of steamroll over those things. Uh, and so you had this secret gang database, and then when it became public, um, you know, the police kind of dug their heels in even more. And what we saw was like, they were setting up this database process as something that was for them going to be, uh, was a way for them to say, we're no longer in the bad old days of mass stop and frisk, right? We made a mistake with mass stop and frisk. So now we're going to go after the people who really deserve it. And and that was a very calculated move by the police. Uh, and so part of it is the technology. Part of it is, okay, what is the gang database? How do people get on the gang database? How are the police surveilling people? Uh, are they using algorithms to draw social networks between people, uh, which they are, which is a huge problem, you know, that that's worth another panel. Uh, but all of those things um, that they were doing um, were, uh, it was them kind of trying to pivot away from saying like, we've, we're no longer the bad police, we're now the good police. We're doing precise policing or what they call precision policing. And so those buzzwords that you see, community policing, precision policing, uh, community-oriented policing, neighborhood policing—it's still policing, and policing again at the at, at its at its core, at its most fundamental uh, uh, place, 
uh, is one where you see those three elements I described, complete police having almost complete arbitrary power over the process, um, complete uh, uh, race, racially disparate uh, uh, policing and, and, and tagging of people. Um, and so you, you kind of had at, at some point say it doesn't even matter what's in front of that word policing. It's the, the question is, what is policing and what how do how can we talk about it in a way where we're getting at its root meaning? So that is a perfect segue. Thank you, Jessmar, and to Tawana, who I know uh, you've done a lot of work around the question of um, really what is community safety and what does it have to do with policing or does it have to do with policing? Uh, so I'd love to turn it over to you to talk about some of the work you've been doing uh, in Detroit. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, again, I serve as the Data Justice uh, Program Director for Detroit Community Technology Project, and uh, I convene the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition. I am also a um, non-resident fellow at, uh, for the Digital Civil Society Lab at Stanford PACS. So um, I want to start with the fact that I am 43 years old, and for my entire life, I have lived in a city that has been assumed uh, full of criminals um, and hopeless, helpless human beings who don't care about their city. So I'm in Detroit. Um, as a child, my city was 90% Black. It is now a little over 80% Black. And so you can imagine um, if, you, if you don't live outside of Detroit, you actually don't have to imagine. You could think back about some of the things that you've read, read heard, or um, seen um, as narratives about where I come from, where I grew up, where I was educated. So I'm gonna start with that. Um, when you have a city that is uh, deemed um, as a whole globally as a, a space full of people who need to be tracked, trailed, traced, monitored, surveilled, and targeted, it's really easy to implement policies and procedures um, and laws over that city with little resistance um, inside the city and outside of the city. Uh, and so I'm gonna, I just wanna uh, preface everything I say with that. So I grew up um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a system where I was used to going through metal detectors um, and being searched by law enforcement uh, and, and school from, I don't even remember what age, from very early on in my life, I was used to being um, considered uh, guilty until proven otherwise. Now you add on technology to that sort of um, assumption that is made about Detroiters. Uh, around 2016, I joined um, with uh, several partners across three cities in a research program called Our Data Bodies. And what this was, was our way of trying to figure out how community members across the, these three cities uh, were feeling that their information was being utilized by government institutions, including law enforcement. And one of the running themes that came across those three cities was that community members felt like they were watched. They wanted to be seen, but they felt like they were being watched. They were being targeted that decisions were being made about their lives based on data that was being extracted. And then this misinformation uh, was being shared around, amongst other institutions to determine whether they could get water, housing, get a good job, um, uh, have make a living or, or any of those things that are needed to survive and thrive. And so at the same time that we were learning about this um, data stream and data trail that was targeting so many people, unhoused populations, formerly incarcerated populations, uh, people in poverty um, generally, um, and mostly black and brown communities, uh, Project Greenlight was ramping up in Detroit. So it started off as this mass surveillance uh, system, public-private partnership between law enforcement, law enforcement tech companies, um, as well as like Guardian Alarm Company, Comcast Cable, and private businesses to add eight or nine surveillance cameras at the time in 2016 to like gas stations. So it was supposed to be places that were staying open past 10 p.m. Uh, essentially. Since 2016, that surveillance system has expanded to over 700 businesses, um, including uh, public housing, uh, medical facilities, schools, recreation centers, grocery stores, laundromats, um, you name it, 
Um, and these are green flashing lights that never turn off. So if you live across the street from a Project Greenlight location, chances are there's a green flashing light coming through your bedroom window 24 hours a day, seven days a week, attached to surveillance cameras that are uh, monitored by real-time crime centers, which now, of course, Detroit has three. So these are law enforcement and analysts who watch these cameras 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and they also, some of them, have access to these cameras on their cell phones. So I mentioned that at the start of our data bodies, we were hearing from community members that they wanted to be seen and not watched. And this was prior to Project Greenlight even ramping up in the city. So since the ramping up of Project Greenlight, we've now since learned that there are over 2,000 cameras. They have now invested in traffic lights. All of these cameras can uh, have access to license plate readers. Uh, officers are able to take their cell phones home and look at these cameras. Some, not every officer, but some officers are given that capability. And so they can sit on their couch and watch television and watch you across the camera at the same time. In 2017, Detroit um, police acquired facial recognition technology. We did not know that they had facial recognition technology. Um, until actually a Georgetown Center for Privacy and Technology report came out that identified that uh, DPD was using facial recognition. The facial recognition uh, policy contract that they entered into allowed for them to have real-time crime surveillance on any camera that they could get, their ac get access to, including drones, body-worn cameras, mobile devices, unlimited mobile devices, um, and any, basically any technology that they could leverage um, facial recognition on. Now we know, based on Joy Boilamwini's and Timnet Gebru's uh, uh, research out of MIT, that facial recognition is essentially uh, misidentifies darker skin tones. Detroit is 80 plus percent black. So we have law enforcement using facial recognition technology in a city full of darker skin tones. So we knew um, as soon as we learned that facial recognition was being attached to the Project Greenlight program that um, we were gonna have misidentifications. Now we currently have two, Michael Oliver and Robert Williams. And so, and we, we can guarantee that there are many more, but these are the two that have been unearthed so far. Uh, also, Detroit police, when, they, when we found out about facial recognition technology, they said that the technology was only going to be used for quote unquote violent crimes. Well, uh, Michael Oliver was arrested using facial recognition technology for allegedly snatching a cell phone and Robert Williams was arrested for allegedly stealing watches. Both cases we know that they were not the par parties that did the alleged crime and we both know and we also know that those are not violent crimes. In addition to that, um, knowing that this technology is flawed, we would not want people with violent, uh, uh, accused of violent crimes being uh, accosted uh, using facial recognition technology because we understand that they probably won't get out of the, the criminal justice system. So you're looking at folks with, you know, watches and cell phones being uh, harassed and their lives being upended and permanently changed. But imagine if they had been accused of murder or something else. Um, in addition to that, we understand that facial recognition, even if the algorithms were accurate, that the criminal justice system already has too many biases baked into it to allow for law enforcement to have access to this technology. So uh, in addition to us having facial recognition, uh, Project Greenlight, uh, Detroit also has cell site simulators. Um, I look out of my window um, every single day and I see drones flying across the sky as if, you know, it's a, a Goodyear blimp or something. It's almost like it's, it's so ubiquitous that, um, that, like I said, a lot of people are not rising up because this is a fully black city. So it's really difficult to convince the world that we need to be defended. Um, and that's the advocacy um, that Josemar was talking about earlier is that, um, you know, a lot of times when, the, when narrative has been so powerful for so long, um, it really does take a long time for folks to wake up and decide that our humanity and our civil liberties are worth uh, advocating for. So um, um, I'll take you into a little bit more gloom before I bring you out of it a bit. 
Um, in addition to Project Greenlight facial recognition, cell site simulators, we also now have Operation Relentless Pursuit and Operation Legend operating in Detroit. So these are, this is that collaboration with the U.S. Attorney, Attorney General's Office that allows for ATF uh, and federal agents, FBI to basically, and U.S. Marshals to walk through the city of Detroit um, ununiform, really, um, with access to these technologies and target whomever they deem to be violent or um, to be under investigation. And so this is the type of culture um, that we're navigating in in Detroit. Um, literally, the city of Detroit is under a perpetual lineup every single day. And um, no matter who you are, um, unless you are, are, are found innocent by this algorithm, you can assume that you're, you're being uh, assumed guilty. Um, since the year of 1999, every single person in the state of Michigan who's taken a state ID, a driver's license or state ID has had their image loaded to the facial recognition database. So that means if you live in the state of Michigan and you come through Detroit or even the state of Michigan, but, but particularly Detroit, that you are in a lineup, that you are, if there is a case being investigated, that your image, you can assume that your image is one of the images that they are looking through until they find the person that they're looking for. We know um, from the research out of Georgetown Center for Privacy and Technology that law enforcement gets really desperate and starts to do workarounds when they're looking for quote unquote criminals. They've altered and used um, images from sketches and fed them into the database um, they've done all sorts of things, used grainy photos, um, altered and used celebrity images, put faces um, from other people onto uh, mouths of uh, folks if they can't find an accurate match. And so we're not under, we are under no impression that Detroit will be any different um, in using those workarounds to try and target and solve what they consider to be crime. So Detroit Community Technology Project, Detroit Digital Justice Coalition, other partners, uh, the Detroit Justice Center, Greenlight Black Futures Coalition, ACLU. We've been working on ordinances to try and get more community oversight. We are working to try and amend the city's const constitution, which is the, um, the charter. So we've submitted amendments and a Detroit, uh, Detroiters Bill of Rights that will prevent some of these surveillance technologies from taking hold in Detroit. Um, in addition to that, our civilian oversight body meets inside of police headquarters. Um, and so we are trying to prevent them from being able to meet in any law enforcement building. Um, in addition to that, we want them all to be elected and none of them appointed. Currently, half of them are appointed by the mayor. And until recently, our chief was the deputy mayor of Detroit. And so we are literally dealing with a lot of things that many people don't have to deal with um, in their landscape. We've seen a lot of successful bans. Uh, to facial recognition, but most of those cities have been predominantly white. And although I have mad respect for all those organizers and I, I tap into their brilliance um, quite often, um, we know that we're navigating a different terrain here with uh, uh, 700,000 black people. And I'll finally say one of our counter com uh, campaigns is green chairs, not green lights. Um, and it's asking community members to come back to the front porches to look out for one another, to, to engage in this turning to one another that, that prevents some of the quality of life issues um, that lead to quality of life crime. And so if we make sure our neighbors have water and food and resources, then the likelihood of crimes being committed will be uh, uh, rare. So, um, so those are just some of the things that I'm engaged in and I will, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Tawana. And I think there's, um, you know, a few things that I would draw out of that. And I think what's really interesting in listening to you, you know, you've hit on a lot of the technologies that the police are using, uh, but the organizing and the solutions are all very much the organizing and the solutions that people have always used. It's about community knowledge, community information, community organizing, community showing up, community transparency. Um, and so I think that's a really important thread to all of this. I will also say a couple of things that I heard in there. I think there's always mission creep. Right. They always tell you like, oh, we just want to monitor these few late night places and then they're monitoring everywhere. Oh, we've just used face recognition for these really serious crimes. And I actually heard a certain police chief who I won't name because it was an off the record meeting say, well, what are we supposed to do? You know, someone's going to say like, well, why did you use face recognition for this person? But when they, you know, stole my big screen TV, you didn't use face recognition for me. And so I have to use it for everything because, you know, then you're biasing people. 
And so you, we always often get power, powerful technology introduced with the idea that you have to upend these really serious crimes. And they'll talk about things like child abduction, which is horrific, but actually extremely rare, and then use it on everything. And so, John, that brings us to you, and I think this is sort of the perfect segue, because, you know, coming from Oakland, you guys have done a lot of work on transparency. Um, you yourself have done a lot of work in the community in terms of looking, you know, not even just at the criminal system, but across the board at the systems that, you know, are doing what Tawana said, which are failing communities that then lead to, lead to quality of life crimes. So I'm happy to turn it over to you. Uh, yes, thank you. I want to start by saying good afternoon. My name is John Jones III. I'm on staff with Just Cities, where I serve as the Director of Community and Political Engagement. I am also formerly incarcerated. And for me, when we talk about surveillance, I want to start there, because a lot of this to me is really an issue of privacy and boundaries. When you are incarcerated, you literally, there is no privacy. That word does not exist, whether it's your body, whether it's the mode of communications. Uh, when you first get arrested, more often than not, you will see a sign over the phone that tells you that all your phone calls are recorded and monitored. The same is true for mail. The same is true for visiting. And when you think about that, what is the point and purpose when we talk about surveillance? I ask that question for a reason, because more often than not, when I talk to people about these issues, this is what I hear a lot of. If you have nothing to hide, what's the issue? What's the problem? Let's just start there. Does anyone, would anyone feel comfortable with the idea and concept that if you're using a public bathroom, there's a camera there recording you? What about in the shower? So that tells me most people say no. <laughs> if not, maybe you're into, you know, they got voyeurism. So there's different people in the world, we're not judging anybody. But I think the point is, I think for most of us, is there's a clear need for boundaries. And I want to give an example of something. So in Oakland recently, uh, we have what's known as the BRT, the Bus Rapid Transit System, which was engineered and designed to increase, or actually in other ways, uh, um, decrease the amount of time it takes uh, to utilize public transportation from East Oakland to downtown, for example. More recently, we just, real, we just found out that uh, they're going to install these cameras. And they say the purpose of these cameras is to record people who either park and or utilize the bus only lane. And as a result, there would be a fine associated with that. My first issue is always transparency. This was never communicated to the community. We should always have a right to know whenever we're being monitored. This isn't just about whether or not a crime is being committed. This is about consent. This is about awareness. Because one of my concerns is, number one, what would this information be used for? Number two, who has access to this information? And then number three, there's always unintended consequences. So I want to give a quick example in this situation of what will pose as an unintended consequence. If you're at the bus stop and you're at the platform and you're getting on the bus and something happens around you, if you are recorded with this activity taking place, it puts your own freedom in jeopardy. You are placed in peril. You, might be, you may end up being subpoenaed and required to testify about something that you have no knowledge of, but because your image is there, you're connected. As someone that's formerly incarcerated, I want to go a little deeper. There are conditions when one is placed on parole. One of those conditions is you're not allowed to quote unquote associate with, I hate the word felons, you're not allowed to associate with people with criminal records. If I'm standing there on parole next to somebody else that's on parole and I don't know this person, then how do I know that? How can I be sure that our images collected won't be used against us? What would be my defense for that? Because it's interesting that our criminal injustice system, the, uh, the preposition is innocent to proven guilty. Many of us with personal experience know it's the other way around. <laughs> We're guilty until we can prove our own innocence and whatever that means and whatever that looks like. And my concern about the BRT in particular is because it goes through a predominantly black and brown and even an Asian and Pacific Islander community. So there's always a racialized aspect when decisions are made. In fact, I'm always mindful of the quote that Dr. Huey P. Newton said, police is the instrument of the system. Police is short for policies. When we talk about law enforcement, what dictates enforcement? Usually a policy that's created. And we know policies in both its creation as well as its implementation are not created equal. I want to give an example of that, because when we're dealing with technology and surveillance, what we're dealing with is human beings and human nature. What is the difference between George Floyd and Dylan Roof? George Floyd was accused of a nonviolent crime, passing counterfeit money. And we all know, the world know and watch what was the result of that. It led to the death 
of another unarmed black person. Dylan Roof was accused of killing nine people, ambushing nine innocent black people in a church. That result ended up not only in him being arrested, by him being killed or harmed, but as the story goes, he was treated to a meal from Burger King. So when we talk about these issues, it's not, we can never ever isolate or segment the racialized aspects of that. And I appreciate what Tawana shared because I think about uh, a lyric from Too Short. He says, Detroit, it's like Oakland, it's a black thing and I'm a black man. If you think about the history of Oakland, one of the many things Oakland is famous for is the Black Panther Party for self-defense. And we know a result of that was our federal government, specifically the FBI, the director, J. Edgar Hoover, declared the Black Panthers to be the greatest threat to the eternal security of the United States. And as a result, the COINTEL program was created, which clearly included civilians. And it wasn't just monitoring the Black Panther members or their actions. It was being involved in a manner to encourage criminal activity, to pit them against other groups. It also included the mass arrests and even shooting deaths of members of the Black Panther Party. Keep in mind at the same time, J. Edgar Hoover denied the existence of the mafia. So when we're talking about things like crime, we have to always be mindful who becomes the target and who's not. So to me, a lot of things dealing with civilians, those are what I call the intended consequences. It's the over-policing of black communities and communities of color. I wanna add one more thing to that as well, as it relates to criminal background records. We live in a digital age where many people have access to it. And here's the issue. First of all, there are many inaccuracies in criminal background checks. For example, I recently moved into a new home and as I was applying, I received information Mind you, it was gathered and collected by a third party entity. It stated that I went to prison in 1983. I was nine years old. That's impossible for me to be in prison, but I didn't have recourse because they had access to something that was inaccurate. And then a property manager told me that they go solely off the basis of what this third party entity states. So it's one thing to gather the information and to disseminate it. It's something else when it's inaccurate. In fact, in the state of California with the Fair Credit Reporting Bureau, it states explicitly that the information that is contained in those documents, it's a great chance that they're inaccurate. Why do we maintain these systems? What is the purpose of that? That's the conversation that we're having now and that's something I want folks to think about. The last thing I wanna share is what I call the unintended consequences because racism is a clear intended consequence of that. Make no mistake about it but some of the unintended consequences, again, relating to who has access and what that's used for. So I wanna give an example. The city of Berkeley had recently passed an ordinance that um, there were lots of stores who uh, were not accepting cash. They said you have to have a debit card. We know a lot of people don't have bank accounts. Not every person has a debit card. But going deeper, when you use your card, whether it's a credit card, a debit card, that is a form of electronic surveillance. Do people really need to know my spending habits, right? You can look at it on the low side is for those of us who get bombarded with these advertisements, we know that there's people who collect, they, they monitor our browsing habits and they use that for profit. But going deeper, to me, it goes back to the issue of privacy. For example, alcohol is legal. I am of, of age, I'm 46 years old. So I have the legal right to purchase alcohol. But who is collecting that information and what would it be used for? That to me creates a great concern because we have to always look at this notion of what I always say, just because something is legal, what I mean by legal, when we talk about surveillance, doesn't mean that form of behavior is moral. So I wanna be clear on that. We have to be very vigilant in our community when it comes to how we are being surveilled and what that information is used for. So it goes back again to that balance. How much dignity do I have? How much privacy do I have? And at the end of the day, for me, it's almost like putting a carrot or putting the, the, the cart before the horse. We know how criminalization works in America. Many of us have already been criminalized from our birth and systems are set up to quote unquote prove, to justify that myth. I'm gonna leave everyone on this last note as it relates to the gang injunctions because that they attempted to do that in Oakland and it was successfully defeated, right? Not only were there information in there inaccurate, but again, I like to ask this question as I close. By race, what percentage of people who are gang members have the highest representation? What percentage by race 
has the highest percentage of those who commit quote unquote gang related homicides and are also victims of a gang related gang related homicides? I'm gonna give you the answer. It's white people. We don't think of that because when you think of white gangs, or actually we don't, but bikers are considered a gang and they make shows like the Sons of Anarchy. So it seems like certain things are celebrated and romanticized in a manner to where we don't even see that. We don't even make that direct correlation because they're hyper-focus on black and brown communities. So this is at the end of the day, for me, a lot of this is really informed by America, by white supremacy, and by how we have internalized these things that we've been indoctrinated with. So we have to unpack all of that as we move forward in the 21st century. So I wanna thank you all. I want to thank you all as well. I think anyone who's ever put a panel together, you know, you sort of have like your wish list and then you have your like, who do I go to if I can't get these people? In case you all didn't notice, I got my wish list panel um, and they were even better than I thought it was going to be. And I thought it was going to be really great. So I appreciate all of you. Um, and I want to pull a couple of threads together before we go to Q&A. Uh, John, I'll tell you at NECDO, we don't like the word felons either. We don't use it. Um, and I think in terms of moving forward, though, I think some of the, the other threads to pull through this, I think there's no doubt that sort of it starts and ends with white supremacy, the question of surveillance. But, you know, I think it also, when you look at anything they roll out, it is always rolled out the places where people seem to be most vulnerable, least sympathetic in the public view, or maybe least powerful in terms of the ability to react. So they go to black and brown communities, they go to poor communities, uh, they go to border communities, right, and immigration, the people who they think will be seen as least sympathetic where they say, oh, well, you know, we have, we have to stop illegal border crossers or we have to deal with these gang problems. We have to deal with these, you know, very serious things. Um, but what ends up happening is it gets normalized and it doesn't stay in those communities. It doesn't ever stay in those communities, just like it doesn't stay at the gas station. It doesn't stay in, the, in those communities. And, and normally you don't sort of hit the big uproar until it hits uh, the broader public, right? The wealthier public, the whiter public. Um, and, and, you know, you've seen some glimpses of that. I think I'm, I'm a little hopeful in this moment, though, that we don't have to go that far. And I think the other piece when it comes to surveillance, and I think this is what you're speaking to, John, the parts that people don't even think of as surveillance, right? They think of maybe what's happening that if I walked out of my house and went in front of these cameras or somewhere else, that might, that might affect me. Uh, but they don't consider the way in which we surveil communities uh, who in many ways are sort of their, their power, they have less power in the context of society, which is, you know, people who are coming off of a prison sentence, right? You have very little control over what happens when you come out. You're checking in 27 times a day in 27 different ways. Um, we don't think about people who have to access public benefits, right? Who are forced to do things like uh, literally take drug tests to get their benefits or and things like that. As, it, people don't see that as a form of surveillance, but it's absolutely a form of surveillance, right? And then, you know, if you want to draw comparisons uh, and I'll say this is my position on any CDL position in case I get myself in trouble here. But, you know, nobody, nobody looks to the corporation to get all their benefits to say, well, you know, we, we need you all to pee in a cup. Right? <laughs> we need to know if you're using cocaine or Adderall or something before we hand over billions of dollars. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very much a societal double standard. Um, I do want to see just uh, we, we do have a question. It's open for other questions. But I wanted to see if, if any of you had something you wanted to respond to what somebody else said, because I think. Um, there was a lot that was put forward. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Please and, jump in. And, 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 and Jumana, I want to include you in this too, because you made, <laughs> me, <laughs> you made me think about this, right? And so um, one of the things that we're thinking about right now a lot is the survey and, and surveillance, the term surveillance is normalized within the medical industry, right? Especially around like COVID-19 um, and other like pandemics or uh, viruses and things. But um, and trying to shift the narrative, you know, one of the things we push back against is this conflation between surveillance and safety, right, even in a pandemic. Um, and so uh, one of the architects of mass surveillance, as an example, in our city um, is Dan Gilbert. Um, he, prior to our Detroit Police Department having Project Greenlight, he had his own, and we're seeing this in a lot of places where the billionaire buys up the surveillance cameras puts it everywhere and tells people to use it to, to, to protect the city. Um, that happened in Detroit, which expanded on to us having Project Greenlight. I'm, I'm bringing this up uh, for a reason. Just recently, he was given the contract for contact tracing. Um, there's no good reason for a billionaire who's not in medical to have the contact tracing contract which lets us know that surveillance and data extraction 
um, has nothing to do with safety. Um, and so I'm wondering what you all are thinking about what you're seeing in your respective places. Um, what's the dialogue? What's the debate around the current, how, how some of these systems are really ramping up um, because of COVID, right? We're in another desperate situation, the pandemic of racism, the pandemic of the virus and, um, and how these systems are being given an opportunity to kind of move full speed ahead um, with little scrutiny. And so it's a, it, we're thinking about that a lot and I'm, I'm just wondering what everybody's thinking about that. I have some thoughts. Um, I will say this is, again, this is not an official NACDL position. This is me as Jimena speaking on this. Um, you know, we, we have looked into this. We actually have a webinar up on our website that, that addresses sort of the contours of what this looks like. I think my thought is on, it, it, this isn't really much different than everything else we've talked about, right? We're, we're taking a situation uh, where there really is a serious threat to people's uh, safety and health, right? And that is undeniable. There's no question about that. And it's really disproportionately impacting uh, Black and Latino people. And there's no question about that. At the same time, you know, is this really a solution or is this an opportunity when it comes to the question of surveillance and contract tracing? And I think this is more an opportunity than it is a solution. Um, and I'll tell you why I think that. Because right now, what is clear to me is that they, um, there's a lot of ways of doing contact tracing. And the ways that seem to be most effective are the old school ways, right? Or so I go somewhere, I get tested, they say, hey, you're positive. This hasn't happened if my coworkers are worried, I'm at home anyway. But so they say, okay, so I'm positive. And then someone calls me up on the phone and says, you know, did you go to the grocery store? Did you go to something? Why is this different than an app? Uh, for a number of reasons. One is the app may or, not, may or may not be correct at any of the kind of contact I had with somebody, right? So it's possible I had contact with John Doe, but it was like, actually not really, he's just my next door neighbor and there's a wall between us and it's irrelevant contact, right? So maybe I'm close to him approximately, but it's not a relevant contact. It's possible I had very brief contact with Jane Doe, but really Jane Doe was like a love interest and you know, I saw her for a minute in the hallway, but it was like hot and heavy and close, right? That could be a much more serious contact than John Doe who is like through the wall next door, but you don't know that through an app or some kind of contact tracing. I think the other thing is just the reality of old school, what does it mean? Like you don't think about everything you've done. And so the chance to talk to someone who would say, by the way, did you happen to go grocery shopping? Did you run to 7-Eleven? Did you do this? Did you, that helps spark your memory. Um, so, you know, I think the question of technology is, uh, yeah, everybody will try to build it, especially if there's money in it. Does that mean that it is the right solution? I don't think it's showing that it is at this point. And it's also been done in some really creepy ways in other places. So, you know, again, I think it's back to, it's not about whether you can, it's about whether you should and whether that's the most impactful way. Um, but there are a couple of questions that are not our, our questions. So I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in on that. Okay, so I wanna, um, there is uh, one question is, what do the members of the panel, uh, what views do the members of the panel have regarding surveillance defined awkwardly as communities policing the police using available technology? So not surveillance, but surveillance. Like, the community surveilling the police versus vice versa. Do you all have thoughts, opinions on that? Oh uh, Yes, I'll go. Uh, I believe every institution in our society and community uh, is created or at least should be created for the overall health of that society. So with that being said, that's a form of uh, accountability. We the people, we're the power, right? And we operate under this representing a form of democracy that's supposed to happen at our informed consent. I don't have an issue with residents, um, quote unquote, you know, monitoring what the police does. Uh, not only do we know that's needed, but to me, that's just a form of holding them accountable. And this is something I always share. You know, law enforcement in particular, they, they pledge an oath to do what they do. Um, so that, to me, becomes part of that process. So things look differently as it does as a, a resident, for example, because none of us plead an oath we're not paid by taxpayer dollars to go about our lives. So to me, that's the difference. But I do appreciate this question because at the end of the day, I, I do want to throw something in there real quickly. I've talked to some of my colleagues uh, when we talk about police uh, brutality and you know recording those incidents and reporting it. I had a buddy that told me, he said, man, I'm not into that. I said, why? He said, man, that's like snitching. That's snitching on the police. So it just goes back to how we have these internalized ideas and notions about things that occur. And that's why, once again, I appreciate this conversation because we just have to have conversations on, on how things really look and what does that mean for us? Chris Martwana, yeah. you wanna weigh in? Yeah, I'm glad you, uh, two things. 
Uh, the, I agree with John, uh, the accountability factor is necessary. Um, and, and we need more protections in place for, for community members who decide to, to, um, to, to monitor what law enforcement is doing. I mean, John talked about the Panther Party earlier, and we've seen the repercussions that come to community members who, who essentially uh, uh, report on uh, crimes uh, committed by law enforcement. Um, and we still don't have many protections, or if we do, they're not being, um, they're not being used to protect the public. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the teenager, right, who, um, who recorded George Floyd's murder. I mean, a horrific, horrific public lengthy murder. Um, and she was, she's not protected by anyone, really. Um, and she's been, you know, publicly asking um, that people like not harass her um, of, of all, you know, whether it be public or law enforcement or anyone. And so um, I think that we need a longer conversation about, um, about what it means to, to whistleblow essentially um, in, this, in this society. Um, and in addition to that, um, there, the, the snitching thing is, is, really, is really interesting um, because it, a lot of folks don't even know what it means, right, to be a snitch. A snitch is, is someone who is in commission of that crime who then decides for their own protection to flip. That is not, being a responsible community member is not a snitch. And I think that we need to have many deeper dialogues around what it means to look out for one another, to see each other, to, to be responsible community members and make sure that, um, that we're reducing the quality of life issues that uh, folks are dealing with um, in our communities so that we can have healthy communities. And so, um, and finally, I'll say, Jemana, you mentioned like earlier on about um, like the arguments for surveillance, like rape uh, or child kidnapping, right? And so that's why we believe that like returning to the front porches, looking out for one another, seeing each other is another form of reducing those types of harms because we'll see the children walking to school. Um, we'll see the elder person come in in the evening. Um, we'll see the neighbor whose water was shut off and we'll know to support them and those sorts of things. And so, yeah, I, I just wanted to put those points out there. So I have a, a couple of thoughts about that concept of surveillance because on the one hand, um, you know, if police are going to have surveillance cameras or access to surveillance cameras across the city, you can have community members who film police and who try to document. I mean, and, and that stuff has been very useful. It was very useful in, in the case around Eric Garner. It's, it was useful uh, in the unfortunate death of George Floyd. Um, but on the other hand, I've heard arguments and I've heard, I've read articles that said, well, we need to have more data on police misconduct so we can predict who are going to be the most dangerous or the next police officers to, to kill somebody or that we need um, to have a broken windows for bad police officers. And my concern with that is that you, if you, if you embrace those concepts, even kind of in a, in a kind of, you know, kind of an ironic way, like, Oh, look, we're going to do to you what you do to us. Um, Unfortunately, the police, there's a power imbalance into the information and, and, and oftentimes the technology, technological savvy that the police have. And so if you legitimize those concepts, if you legitimize the idea that you can predict people's behaviors, yes, you may be able to do, to, to, you know, to have this concept of finding bad cops, but then police will be able to do that to us and they'll have much more of, of the power to be able to actually execute on that concept than we do. Um, and so I'm a little bit afraid of of people getting enamored with that idea that we can use those things because, because then those things become normal in our minds and then become normal in our society. And then the police can build off of that and work off of the next thing. So in that regards, I'm a little bit concerned. Um, I'm like the social media surveillance, there's also a school of thought that you can surveil young people, uh, you know, to find out who needs help. Uh, but in, in no... In, in, in the real world, the police will be doing the surveilling and they'll be doing the criminalizing. And so I think the, the, the other way is to just say, well, we don't need these types of technologies and we don't need to embrace them. We actually need to call for those things to be ended or the, these things to be erased. Um, and I know that's kind of hard because some people think, well, if the genie is out of the bottle, you can't put it back in. We can't like put technology, we can't go backwards. 
But I think it's important for a lot of activists to be able to say, well, we need to just emphatically say no to these types of technologies because we know that police will abuse them and the police have a, a, a disproportionate amount of power to harm our communities with them. I, if, you, if you need any example of that, think of all of the work and all of the marching and all of that, ha that had to be done just to get one police officer fired for the killing of Eric Garner. To get one police officer off the force, it took over five years and it took a Herculean effort by the community. Uh, and but for a police officer to snatch one person off the streets and throw them in jail for 20 years, it's like this. So I just remind people of that power imbalance. You know, it's interesting. I think just coming off of what you just said, just far, I feel like uh, that was your Audre Lorde moment, right? You can't use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. And so it is really sort of radically reimagining how we go forward. And when people say, well, the genie's out of the bottle, what do you do? That brings me back to uh, Nelson Mandela quote, which is, you know, it always seems impossible until it's done. And so I think, you know, we're just about the business right now of getting it done. So if I know we have to wrap up, if each of you want to give like a quick one minute wrap, I want to just thank you all so much. I've found this conversation to be really fascinating. Like I said, you all are my dream panel and I got to sit here and facilitate this discussion. So I appreciate that very much. And if you want to go to, I guess, in the order we went uh, or backwards, whichever, just jump in, but let's do a quick wrap and thank you so much. Uh, no, I just want to say thanks for having me. The The name of the panel, uh, the Robocop piece, I think is really important because, uh, I mean, that, that movie was actually a warning from that director, right, of these Orwellian things that were to come. Um, and I, say, I think it's important to think about that concept of that future is here now and that these futures, but, but that the future is, is in our hands. It's not in the police's hands. The police like to think that it's in their hands, but we, uh, we build the future because this future is for us. Ashe. And I'll also say as a city that actually has a RoboCop statue being unveiled at any point, which is ridiculous, um, <laughs> um, we, have to, we have to really uh, push back against the conflation between surveillance and safety. Um, and it, it's really time for us to show um, the world uh, what it means to care for one another, um, to, to define criminality as what it is, uh, extreme poverty, housing injustice, um, and, the, and white supremacy, um, and the systems that have lined up to make sure that we're not able to make a livelihood. And so if we address quality of life crimes, which is what the defund police argument is about, and reinvest the surveillance monies into communities and make sure that we can care for one another, then we'll have less and less policing in our neighborhoods. And so I think that's the, the move that we need to be making. I just wanna say, first of all, I'm just grateful to be a part of this. Uh, I'm always mindful that of the importance of learning. It's not just presenting as if I'm a subject matter expert as much as being able to receive and learn. And I received a lot, so I'm full. With that being said, I just want to say two things. Uh, one is, I'm paraphrasing this quote by Benjamin Franklin, uh, with the full understanding that some people may consider it controversial, or at least don't agree in what it means. But those who are willing to sacrifice liberty for safety don't deserve either. And I think that's, to me, ultimately what this comes down to. What, what is public safety? And how do we redefine public safety, specifically in the 21st century, when we're dealing with archaic notions such as the police, such as prisons, our criminal injustice system? These are archaic systems, and many of us are waking up to that reality. What does it mean for us to be safe? We have to have those conversations to redefine it, to, to address the internalized notions of what we have been dealing with and what, for the most part, we have accepted. The last thing I want to say is this, because I have no problem being explicit naming white supremacy. I think, especially in this moment where there's uh, much conversation around what does it mean to be a white ally, I want to offer this, just from historical context and standpoint. White people are also victimized by white supremacy. So this should not be seen as, yes, we know uh, the disproportionate racial impacts, but I wanna be clear on a few things. Uh, white supremacy didn't begin in America, it began in England. And if we look at even in America, some of the first slaves, quote unquote slaves were indentured servants. And I think what happens is there's a dynamic that's set up to where those who are considered the least valuable in our society are always the easiest ones to victimize because most people look the other way. But at some point in time, it's gonna climb up that proverbial ladder right? So we can nip it in the bud when it first begins, or we can sit back and it's like someone has that quote, you know, they came for this group of people and I was solid. 
The same thing is true in this moment. So I want all of us to think of this from a human standpoint. Yes, race and the reality of race is real. But at the end of the day, don't just view this as something that's just impacting black and brown people. Because sometimes people think only black and brown people should deal with this. We as a nation have to grapple with a lot of things, including our history, including where we at now. But at the end of the day, when the Black Panther Party said all power to the people, that was something I was raised and taught with, and that's something I believe. All of us, we the people, must come together to ensure the safety, not just ourselves, but I end on this as a single father of a five-year-old. I dare to dream of a world 10 years from now when he's of driving age. And the one thing I don't want to see is him going through the same things I went through as a child. Now is the time, this is the moment to convert these collection of moments into a movement to create something that's truly sustainable and elevate all of us in this moment. So thank you all once again, and take care of yourselves and please be safe. Thank you. I know Monica, you've got to wrap it up and move us on. Yes, so thank you so much, Joanna, and for the panel that you assembled. I mean, just wonderful.